the recording so welcome back everyone also when you're watching it on Moodle um, we just talked about how you can load in a BMP image and then display it in the R plot window just using the image function like this um, so I hope that that will be useful we will get back to it at a certain point in time and you guys can practice a little bit during the assignments as well but trust me it's not gonna be on the exam all right, so here's where the break should have been. So I already told you about several functions to load data into R, like the data for loading data from an R package, um, read.table, read CSV, you can read lines. Yeah, I'm recording, I'm recording. I definitely need like a red thing somewhere so that people know that I'm recording. Um, so, and, and we can read binary files. Um, but then the question becomes what to do after, right? Now I've loaded my data into R and now I want to do something with it. So generally what you want to do with your data is um, something like filtering, right? Um, generally you don't load one data set in, um, but generally you have different data sets, right? So I have, for example, a data set which contains um, some measurements on individuals and then I did sequencing and I have another file where there are sequences for certain individuals um, so hey if we want to combine data or filter data we can use the in function for that um, have for example imagine that I have two matrices matrix A and matrix B and I, wa I want to know um, if have both both matrices have an ID column, right? So uh, matrix A has a column called ID, matrix B has a column called ID, and now I want to take all of the elements of matrix A which have a corresponding ID in matrix B. What I can then ask is A, take the ID column, which of these or uh, which are in matrix B in the ID column. So I can match two matrices together um, and then I can say well I want to take the subset of matrix A where all the elements in A also occur in matrix B. So I can then use this, this logical vector, right? This will just say true, false, true, true, true for all the elements in A. So I can create a subset of matrix A using this true, false vector very similar to what we saw before saying that um, a measurement larger than three right that's the same thing that we're doing here but now we're taking two matrices and asking well what is which elements of a are in b of course we can ask the opposite question as well we can also ask which elements of b are in a and then we can use that to subset matrix b the which allows you to transform this logical vector into a numeric one, so by the index. So imagine that hey, if we do A and B, then it says true, false, true, true, false, right? So, and then if I say which, then it will tell me one, three, and four. So if I'm writing a for loop, right, and I want to go and do for something, hey, so I can just use the which on the vector that we just created to get the indexes and then I can use the indexes to make a subset but of course I can also say for index in indexes and then go through the matrix A and take only the rows which are also in matrix B and do some computation with it. So the which transforms a logical vector into a numeric one um, and it uses the index number for that. So if I have a vector like this, then it will say one, three and four because one is true, three is true and four is true. So I can use this then to do the subset or I can use it in a for loop to go through the matrix and do something with the rows in A which also occur in B. Of course, you can also use the subset function. Um, yeah, so you can subset a matrix, a vector, or a data frame using a logical vector, and it takes, for example, all the columns with a value higher than six. Yeah, so I can say, well, I have, for example, something which I call selection, right? Because before, I don't know which columns will be, or which um, columns in A will have a value higher than six. So I'm just going to say, repeat the value false for all the columns in A. So now I have a, a true false vector, right? And this is just false, 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 false. So it has the length of the number of columns of A. And then I can, for example, go through each of the columns in A. And then I can say, well, if any of this 
Okay, so I select column X from A. I test if it's larger than 6 and if any of the numbers are larger than 6 then I say well this thing I need to select because this matches my criteria. So some value in A in this column needs to be higher than 6. And then of course I can then use this as well to again make a subset of my matrix. So take the columns directly using selection or I can say which selection. So this will just use the true false factor. This will first take the true false factor, transform it to numerical values, and then select the columns by number. So again, just making your data matrix smaller after you've loaded it in based on some kind of selection criteria. And this is something that is very common um, and which I, I run into a lot yeah, that I load in a matrix and now I want to know for example which column contains a certain value and only take the columns that have that value or a value which is higher or lower. Alright so you can create subsets of matrices. I, you can also use the subset function. I don't use this a lot but I know a lot of people who use it so they don't like to use this which in structure or um, do the matching themselves by using a for loop to go through it. Um, so um, they use the subset function. So here we are looking at the air quality data set um, and the air quality data set which comes built into R um, has four columns. It has a column called temp, a column called day, a, temp uh, a column called ozone and a column called wind. So first thing that I do in R is I load the data set and then I can use the subset function and the subset function takes three parameters or well it, it actually takes two parameters at the minimum um, but the first parameter is the data set that you want to take a subset of then the second is specifying the column that you want to check so take the column temperature higher than 80 right so take all of the rows for which the temperature column is above 80 and then what do I want to select? Well, I only want to select the ozone column and the temperature column. So this will transform your air quality data, which has four columns and has a bunch of rows. It will now give you back the subset for which the temperature is higher than 80. And it will only give you back the ozone and the temperature column. You can also, because it also has the day column, you can also say subset the air quality data set where the day is one, so the first measurement day, and then select and then do minus temperature. So select all of the columns except for the temperature column. So you can, yeah, this is the same as, as when you throw away things from a vector. Um, this is throwing away a single column by the name of the column. You can also subset the air quality data set and don't have a selection parameter so to speak yeah, because here we are not are, don't have a filter parameter so you can leave the filter parameter empty um, so you can say subset air quality and then select for example all the columns between ozone and wind so in this case because it has four columns and ozone and wind are the last it will just take the last two columns yeah, but if you say day to wind then it will take day ozone and wind so it's a, it's, it's a different way of subsetting your matrix. matrix. Um, and a lot of people like this. I'm not the biggest fan of it. Um, but of course, I just want to show you guys that you can use the subset function to do the same thing as what you do, for example, with selection or something that you do with this which in structure, hey, where you're just kind of directly specifying your, your um, selection criteria. Um, we will get back to the air quality data set when we get to plots. So when we start doing plots, we will use the air quality data set as an example on how to create plots um, showing the relationship between days and winds and ozone and, and temperature. All right, so then once we have our matrix, right, we have done our subset, so we have selected the things that we need. Um, then, for example, we want to write it out to a file because my struct or my advice is always when you make an R script, then the R script should begin with loading in data, doing manipulations on your data, and then writing out a new matrix. And then you have a next script, which takes the matrix which you just created, and then does some other manipulations with it, or does some statistics on it, and then writes out the statistics in the end. So the write table function, here you see the descriptor of the, of the function call. So it has a lot of parameters, um, but 
the parameters that I always use and I use the following options because I can then drag the text file to Excel. So when I open up Excel and I drag the text file created by having these options, um, it will automatically go into Excel and it will automatically show the matrix in a, in a proper way um, because Excel only supports the, the tab separator. So how do I write out a, a, a matrix? I say write.table, then you give the name of the matrix, in this case A, so the matrix that we, that we have been using. Then I say file equals a.txt or give it a good file name or a better file name. The separator is true, the row names are false and the quote is also false. So you have to remember that this cuts off the row names. So if you want to keep the row names, you have to add a line above saying that you want to C bind the row names to the matrix. So that because the row names themselves are not a column of the matrix, they are the identifiers of each row. Um, but if you use this and you say row names is false, then you can just directly drag it into Excel and Excel will recognize it as being a 2D matrix and it will load it into Excel properly. So these are, this, these are the options that I always use. Yeah, of course, there are um, risk from redeem. Next slide in German. Okay, that's going to be fun. Um, I actually have no idea what the next slide is. So, uh, <coughs> so had, these are the options that I use. But had, there's a lot of different options. The one that you actually want to sometimes set yourself is the NA equals. Because sometimes you want to say that, no, I want to use for the missing values, I want to use like a dash or an X or something like that. And you can set that using NA equals X. Um, the EOL is the end of line, so that standard is slash N. If you're in Windows, you might sometimes want to use slash R slash N. So, but that's a Windows specific thing. Um, it might actually be that when you install R on Windows that the default for end of line is actually slash R slash N. Um, but that's something that I have to check. But the, normally I only use these parameters and this works perfectly fine. So it writes out the thing and then hey, I just drag it into Excel so that I can look at it and kind of scroll through it more quickly. All right, let me get a sip of coffee. All right, next file, next slide in German. Wir können auch unsere Daten, den wir in R geladen haben, save, äh, nach den äh, Festplatte speichern, ähm, mit, äh, wenn wir den Cut-Funktion nutzen. Und wir haben den Cut-Funktion jetzt gesehen. Ähm, den Sachen, den, äh, es gibt drei Sachen, wo ich oft den Cut-Funktion für nutze. Eins davon ist, ähm, um, einen, ähm, um den Fortgang von den heutigen Vorloop zu zeigen in das R-Window, so in das, in das, in das R-Fenster. So, das bedeutet, dass ich zum Beispiel sage, vor X in 1 bis den, Num äh, den Anzahl der Kolumnen in den Big Data Matrix, den ich habe, so Big Data hier ist ein Matrix. Um, question, if you don't specify it, will return NA as well. If you don't specify it, it will use the NA. It will just say NA in capital letters. So that's the default. It will just use the default value if you don't specify it. Um, so was wir hier machen, ist wir gehen durch eine ganz große Matrix, durch den Kolumn von dieser Matrix. Und was wir dann machen, ist am Ende von den For Loop habe ich so etwas wie cut don x slash n call big data slash n. So, wenn es ziemlich viel Zeit kostet, um durch eine ganz große Matrix hinzugehen, ähm, dann, dann zeigt ich jedes Mal, wenn ich eine Kolumne von den Matrix gemacht habe, dann zeigt er mich, mich eine Meldung mit, wo ich bin. Man kann es auch ganz gut nutzen, wenn man ein Log-File anlegen will. So, wenn man ein File haben will und man will einfach in den File gucken und sehen, wie weit wir sind, hey, dann mache ich oft Cut und dann mit ein, ein, ein Message oder ein, etwas, was ich in die File speichern will und dann sage ich, speichere das nach einem File gen, äh, und den File Name ist log.txt und danach spezifiziere ich, dass ich an diese File anhängen will. So, ich sage append is true und das bedeutet, dass den, den Message, den ich speichern will, am Ende dieses File 
an diese Fall zugefügt werden. Ich kann auch den Cut-Funktion nutzen, um ein Pfeil zu leeren. So, das bedeutet, dass wenn ich ein Pfeil habe, zum Beispiel log.txt, das erste Statement an den Log-File, so den ersten Statement, in den, den ich mache in meinem Skript, ist sage ich Cut nichts, so einfach ein, ein leeres äh, Charakter, nach dem Pfeil log.txt. Und das klärt den ganzen Log, weil ich keine Append-Statement ähm, nutze. All right, I will do it quickly in, in English as well. So if I want to have a progress report in the R window, I can do something like this, right? So I can say 4x in 1 to the number of columns of big data. Um, what do I want to do? Well, I normally have this line last. So I have all the manipulations and it might be that I have a, a function that runs for like 50 minutes um, per column. Yeah, so then after 50 minutes, it will then print done column one of the number of columns. So I get a, like a progress report, which just runs into R. And of course, eh, if my data is big or I have a lot of manipulations that I do, so it takes a long time to do a single column, then now I have a nice progress report, which update, updates me on how long it will, well, not how long it will last, but where I am. You can also use it for a log file, just print a message to the file called log.txt. You have to append this true. Um, and I use this a lot in my scripts. So my scripts um, will, okay, next slide in, in Dutch. <laughs> I might want to limit this to like three times. Like it's like a couple of times is fun, but if I have to switch language too much, we are going to take like five minutes for a slide. But um, so I can use this for a log file and use this in a lot of my scripts where I just do all kinds of statements, right? And at the end of each statement, I just write something to a log file. And you have to make sure that you append to this file, um, otherwise it will just empty out the file. So saying cut nothing to file log will just clear the whole file um, and remove everything that's in there. So the cut nothing file is, some file is a very dangerous statement and you don't want to do this on your input file because it will throw away your entire input file. Okay, this is actually a very important slide. So um, I do it in Netherlands and then I do it in Dutch. Of uh, then I do it in English, not in Dutch. Um, and this goes over to berekeningen, dus um, to herdo. So this is not the only slide. There are two slides, but. Um, Dit stelt je in staat om dus voor, uh, voor een gigantische matrix um, één bij één de berekeningen te doen. En dan op het moment dat je moeder binnenkomt en je computer moet uit of de, de stroom valt uit, dan op dat moment kun je dus direct zeggen van oh mijn god, um, ik moet weg, dus de computer moet uit en dan kun je later kun je verder gaan. Um, dus wat er gebeurt is als eerste um, maak ik een file en die file heet temp en die temp file tmp.txt gaat onze berekening die we gaan doen, gaat die onthouden. He, dus als eerste, voordat ik begin met berekenen, doe ik één keer, maak de file leeg. Dus, dus reset. He, doe, doe, gewoon maak een lege file. In dit geval heb ik een grote matrix gevuld met random getallen tussen, nummer, uh, tussen 0 en 1. En deze, deze file heeft 10.000 regels en 1000 kolommen. He, dat betekent dus dat als ik zoiets als correlatie zou willen berekenen, dat duurt, dat duurt echt wel een paar uur. He, dus wat ik, dan, wat ik dan doe, is dan zeg ik van nou, ik maak een temp, he, want ik moet eerst kijken of ik al berekeningen heb. Dus ik maak een lege matrix. Um, en op het moment dat dus de file die ik heb al bestaat, dan laat ik die file in. En als die bestaat, dan laat ik hem dus in en dan ga ik door met de berekeningen. Um, Dus, en dan de volgende slide hoort erbij. Ik zal de slide ook in het Engels doen. All right, so storing computations as you go is really useful when you have like something which takes a long time and halfway through the power might cut out, right? And then you would lose all of the time that you've already invested and you don't want to lose the time that you already invested. So the thing that you have to do then is to first, and so here we're going to store the results that we have so far in a file called temp.txt. So first things first, I'm going to empty up the file, then I'm going to make a matrix, which is huge. It's a matrix with just 10,000 rows um, and it has a thousand columns. So doing a correlation on this single matrix, big data will take two to three hours. Of course, it might be that halfway through you have to 
leave or the power cuts out and then you lose everything so the the structure here how to do it is is this slide plus the next slide so this is the first part so this is the first part is seeing if there's already some analysis that we need to load in so here let me make a mark because this is wrong minus analysis right so what we are doing is we're creating an empty matrix so it has nothing in there and it has no rows no columns and if this file exists then I'm going to load this file into our variable temp so and then if we then do the next steps right so the next steps might be doing correlation of one column against the next so what do we do is now instead of doing the for loop from one to the number of rows or one to the number of columns we're gonna say for x in the maximum of one and the number of rows of temp plus one so because temp might be empty it starts from one so then the number of rows of temp will be zero plus one then it will take the maximum of one and one which is one however it might be that this file temp.txt already contained like a thousand lines right so if it already contains a thousand lines what will happen at this point is that it will say well the number of rows of temp is a thousand so it should now start at the maximum of one and a thousand and one so it will start at a thousand and one and then continue on to all of the rows that it has in the matrix so we do our analysis and then what we do is we just write the result to the temp file and we use the cut function to do that right so we just append a single line so every time that we get a correlation or a, a, a list of correlation coefficients and stored in results what we then do is we just paste the line on which we currently are the correlation results and we just separate it by tab and then we add a new line at the end to make sure that we go to the next line and we store this in the file temp.txt and we append to the file and we show a progress indicator. So doing this will allow you to continue your analysis halfway through. Because at this point I can just press quit in R or I can just pull the plug from the computer. Um, it will stop, right? R will kind of crash. Um, and at that point it, we still have the calculations that we did stored in this temp.txt file. And by using this structure, we then load it in if it exists. And if it doesn't exist, um, then we just use an empty matrix. And then we just row bind to it. All right, so two very advanced concepts. We're probably not going to use them directly, although there are two assignments. And this is just for you guys to kind of see if you can get it working and see if you can find the idea behind it. All right, so... External data, last part of the lecture, Biomart. So if I have a big biological data set like Ensemble, right, and if I need my data in R, then I can manually search and create an Excel file. Um, but the problem there is that there's a lot of manual slave labor involved because I have to do like a search in Ensemble, then see what Ensemble gives me, then I have to copy paste this to my Excel file to build up my data set. Um, a lot of online data sources they offer things like a bulk download like um, Ensemble has an FTP site where you can just download um, for example all genes in the mouse genome or all genes in the human genome of course now there's less chance of errors right because I'm not copy pasting stuff making my own data set but the problem here is is that when I download these data sets these data sets have very different um, structures Sometimes if I download my data from Ensemble, it will have eight columns. However, if I download a very similar data set from uh, UCSC or from another data source, then the data might look completely different, might have like 12 columns. Um, so to solve this, um, and this difference that every biological database is slightly different and the fact that I don't want to manually like download data and create an Excel file, I can use Biomart. So Biomart is an R package um, which allows you to retrieve data from the main biological databases like Ensemble and UCSC and you can retrieve the data directly in R. So Biomart is a 
community driven project that provides unified access to distributed research data to facilitate the scientific discovery process and it provides most if not all biological relevant databases. Um, it's not something which is specific to R. Um, you can also use Biomark from Perl or from Python or from XML or using a REST API um, but we'll be using R since this is an R lecture, right? So there are three important concepts when we talk about Biomart. So when we talk about Biomart, then we need to know that the, the first concept is the concept of a mart. And a mart is like um, a shopping mall kind of thing, like Walmart, right? Walmart is mart, so hey, it's like a shopping center. So the mart in Biomart is the link to the database that you want to connect to. So for example, the Ensemble SNP database for mouse or the Ensemble gene database for humans, or the Ensemble uh, transcriptome for fish, right? So those are all different data providers, different MARTs. Um, so besides the MART, and if we want to show all possible MARTs that we can connect to, we can use the list MARTs function. And this will give us back a list of all available MARTs um, that we can connect to um, and I think most of them will be Ensemble, but there will be some other databases in there as well. So what we want to retrieve from this shopping mart is called an attribute. So once I've connected to a mart, I can use the list attributes on the mart or on the, on the variable that I get back to show which things we can retrieve from this database. The filter is there to specify what we want to retrieve. So we we provide something to the MART, right? We provide, for example, gene identifiers, or we provide a chromosomal region, or we provide... So to specify to the data provider what we are going to query for, we use filters. So it kind of, a filter is kind of um, something that that tells the data provider what our values mean because we have to give them values, right? We can't just say, give me everything, no. For example, I want to have chromosome one from one to a thousand base pairs, but then I have to say that this chromosome one from one to a thousand base pairs is a genomic region, because otherwise it would not know what I want to retrieve. So three different, the three different concepts which we can use um, and which make Biomart very flexible in a way. Alright, so the first thing that we have to do is install Biomart into R. So um, if you have an older version of R, you have to use this source bioconductor bioxylite and then you can install it by using bioxylite Biomart. If you have a newer version of R, you can just Google. So you can just say Biomart install um, and then you will go to a web page and there it will show you the commands that you need to install Biomart in R. So the problem with Biomart is that it's not available in CRON, so you can't just install it from the main R repository. No, it's something which is provided by Bioconductor. Um, so Bioconductor is a, just a different database with more packages for R. Um, and in this case, hey, we just have to install the package. So we load the package so that we can use the functions. And then we want to, for example, use the SNP database for mouse. So I'm going to say use Mart SNP dataset is musculus SNP. This changes every time, so use the list mart functions to see how the databases are currently called. Because I think it's not called SNP anymore, I think now the mart is called Ensemble underscore SNP. Um, and of course you don't have to connect to Ensemble, you can also connect to some other database. But we use the mart, right, so we specify which data provider we want to use, we specify which data set we want to have. Of course, Ensemble has not just got SNPs on mouse, but it also has got SNPs on different types of fish and cow and cattle and, 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 and goats and these kinds of things. And then we get this SNP DB, right? So this returns more or less an object from which we can read. It's kind of very similar to the file object. And then, for example, we can use this get biomart function and the get biomart function, we have to specify the attributes that we want to retrieve. So in this case, we want to retrieve the ref SNP ID, so the ID for the SNP. We want to retrieve the allele, so we want to see if it's an A to G SNP or a C to T SNP. Uh, we want to have, we want to return the chromosome name, and we want to 
have the start position. And of course, since SNPs are single nucleotide polymorphisms, the end position will be the same as the start position. So just retrieving the start position is enough. In this case, we are going to use the SNP filter. And that means that I have to specify SNP names. I could use a different filter. I could have used a filter called chromosomal region. But in this case, I'm just going to specify the single nucleotide polymorphism by the name of the single nucleotide polymorphism. The values are the ones that are the things that I want to query for. So in this case, I'm just going to query for a single SNP called RS37395614. And then I have to specify the MART. So where do I want to retrieve it from? Well, the MART that I want to use is the MART that I just connected to. So the SNP.db. That's it for today. So very short overview in Biomart, we will have an assignment about Biomart and um, there we are going to read or a whole bunch of SNPs from a file and we're going to retrieve them from Biomart. So we're going to retrieve where they are located. So just for you guys to kind of practice on um, and where do we want to go um, and have what can you do with Biomart. But Biomart is very, very flexible. So um, it's definitely worth reading on a little bit. And had the, the nice thing is it just has like two main functions. So you have the use Mart to connect to a data provider and then you have the get BM, which allows you to get stuff from this data provider. And it will directly give back a matrix um, with the data that you need. All right, so that's it for me for today. Um, why do I need to use the C? Well, the C is just there because you could have specified the list. In this case, you don't have to use the C. It actually becomes more complex because you can actually do two filters at the same time. So you could have like a SNP filter and then a chromosomal region filter. So then it would get only these SNPs when they are in a certain region. Um, and it's more logical when you use genes, right? So I could say get all of the genes on chromosome three from a certain start to a certain end position. And then I only want to have genes which are um, protein coding or which are microRNAs. Um, and then of course the values that I provide is a list. And then the first element of the list is the first filter. And then the second element of the list is the second filter. But I'm using the C here because this normally is not a single value that you want to retrieve because of course you use it for bulk data retrieval. So normally you would have, because the values here, the C I use to specify that this is a vector normally. In this case, if you only want to retrieve one thing, you don't have to use the C. Um, but in, in general, you would want to retrieve a vector or a list of things. Any more questions? Questions can be about any part of the lecture. So if you are, if you have a question about something else, then please do. That's what we're here for. Um, let me check Moodle to see if I have everything uploaded for today. Um, let me also directly actually save the um, um, save the, the, the PDF. Uh, save link as. So let me quickly go back to the beginning where we had the books and open up the second book. Save link as. And then the last book. Okay, yes, they look fine. And then I will go to Moodle and I will see if I have everything on there. All right, so I, I put the lecture online already. Um, so the recordings will come tomorrow. Um, the assignments for three are already there. I also updated the, um, the answers for lecture two. 
and we also have the data file that we need for assignment 3 because we're going to load in data um, thanks bye yeah bye Alexander see you next week or see you on Tuesday um, if you have any questions so let me turn editing on and let me throw the three books that I advised on Moodle and then let's hope that that's and I will move them all the way up so then the first books are there understanding statistics with R and a beginner's guide to R yes 3 p.m. every Tuesday um, it's also on the Moodle by the way so the zoom link is on the Moodle it's all the way on the top so you have the data or the course information and then the second one is the zoom link so also there you can just click the link on 3 p.m. and then you should automatically join the thing of course if you have any issues joining the zoom meeting then let me know then we can fix that but I think for today yeah, so we have the lecture, the assignment, uh, we have the data which belongs to the assignment, and then we have the three books online now. Um, so for anyone interested in reading the, uh, the free Springer books, they can be downloaded from Moodle. And that's it for today. So I actually wanted to try something with you guys who are still here. Because there is a feature in um, there's a feature in Twitch which I never used and that is called rating um, let me see if I can find it I didn't plan this so I'll just um, rate a channel that's it all right so now we need to find someone on Twitch that we can raid because we can just and it's, it's a pretty interesting concept rating so everyone who's currently watching me I can take you to another streamer so we can all just all of a sudden um, Denny raid yeah no but well we can't raid me right because you're already in my channel but like um, one of my favorite streamers and like probably uh, oh that's, that's for mature audiences um, do you think any of these three big books are particularly good? Yeah, they're all good. <laughs> like <laughs> the first one, The Beginner's Guide to R, is something which would be very, very um, interesting to you guys. Uh, you, you guys. Um, the the introductory statistics is a little bit harder, um, and it really works when you have um, a, a statistics knowledge already. If you don't have a lot of statistical knowledge, right, you don't know exactly what an ANOVA is or something like that, um, then this, the third book is the best because the understanding statistics using R assumes that you have some programming experience with R but that you have a very low statistical experience. So it, it kind of explains things like what is a t-test, what is an ANOVA, um, using R to kind of introduce you to these concepts. Um, if you already know a lot about statistics, for example, you have done an SAS course and you know exactly what an ANOVA is, um, but you kind of want to um, know now how to do it in R, then the, the middle book, the second book is the best. Um, but yeah, the first book, um, The Beginner's Guide to R, that's a very basic book um, to learn or to kind of get a feeling on how to do R. Um, All right, let me see. So let me see if there's any science and technology guy that might be interested in. Ooh, there's me. I'm just scrolling Twitch to see if we can find someone to raid. Um, so let me see. Physics course. Um, nah, giraffes live at Toronto Zoo. Who loves giraffes? Wait, there's no giraffes currently in, in picture. There are actually. Let me uh, do the desktop audio. All right. See you later. Yeah. See you. See you next week, uh, Roberto. Good. Um, welcome to Zoo Life TV. I just wanted to try the 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 raid feature to to see if we can just. Um, I'm not a big Twitch user or something like that, so. How do we think about hatchlings in a nesting box? 
anyone has any ideas on, on who we should raid, anyone has a favorite streamer besides me, <laughs> that they think like, oh, that streamer could use a couple of viewers and we just all move over to that one channel of them. Um, ooh, Gorilla's live. That's interesting. Just chickens. Are there any chickens in view? Well, there's a there's a there's a chicken. So. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> Thank you for the lecture. Yeah, bye, Lydia. Yeah. All right, so um, I just have to probably just decide for one of them. Um, new PC building, egg watching. Oh, this is cool. This is cool. All right, I'm I'm just gonna say we're going to go to this channel. <laughs> so. Thanks, Danny. Bye. Yeah, bye, Rigoletti. See you next. See you next week. Um, let me see. Actually, if I got the, uh, um, can I actually make you a VIP? Because that's something that I wanted to check out as well. If I actually got my, um, so let me see. Add a new VIP. Uh, Lydia Rusol. All right, you are VIP. There you go. And then let's make Roberto a VIP as well. Uh, Roberto Flores, Roberto Flo. All right, add role. You will be a VIP as well. Then we will um, add Gener General. General Gulag 93. Yeah, that's you. You will be a VIP as well. And we will add uh, Rigoletti as well. You will be a VIP as well. There you go. Anyone else want to be VIP? Then you can. All right, I'm going to add. Gris, that's such a OP Grisopidae 3, that's you. All right, you will be a VIP as well, so save. Um, Scorita is already a VIP. I will add Mataklau. Since we got some more Mataklau. Yeah, that's you. Add roll, you will be a VIP as well. And Rizvan. All right, you will be a VIP as well. David Scharf, thanks for the lecture. Have to leave. Yeah, see you. See you. Um, David Scharf, I will add you as a VIP as well. David. Sharf. So just that I can kind of get an idea of people that are actively participating, asking questions. Chai Dol at new Chai Dol underscore. All right, VIP safe. I will add Togo Ferro. There you go. You are a VIP as well. And let me scroll up a little bit. Are there more people? All right, Selena, of course. All right, you are a VIP as well. And Alexander is already. All right, so if I missed anyone and you want to be a VIP, then just uh, let me know. All right, so General Gulag actually has his VIP thingy as well. Okay, so I think that um, that's more or less it for the lecture. Um, I will just try the rating thing, just because I want to. Um, so we will do... I have no idea how it works, so you guys just have to tell me if it works. But in theory, how it should work is that um, we should all move to... Um, um, the the other channel. So in the other channel is a bunch of little chickens sitting underneath a lamp. 
So we're just going to do ray channel. Um, all right, so this guy, very good, and then we will start our rate. All right, so everyone's ready, 13 viewers, and then, all right, so 12 people are going to join me to the little baby chicken cam. All right, so right now, interesting. This should stop my stream. I think so. I am wondering. <laughs> 